Good morning, and hopefully a happy Friday ahead. It's 9 a.m. here in Hong Kong, in Beijing, and in Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets China Open. I'm David Inglis. Our top stories this morning: Chinese stocks look set for a reality check as optimism over rescue measures fades, threatening an end to the biggest three-day rally since 2022. Chipmakers in focus, with Intel shares sliding in late trade after giving a bleak forecast for the current quarter. Plus, a Bloomberg scoop, Shein investor is trying to sell shares at a 30% discount as prospects for an IPO dim amid hot competition and regulatory scrutiny. That scoop came out yesterday, but certainly we've got to talk a little more about the broader implications of all this as well. But certainly, we've got to talk about this week, Dave. Mm. What a week it was, right? I wonder if it's a turning point or are things going to fade pretty quickly today? Depends on the news flow. I guess, and yeah. whether or not, I mean, we haven't even, we were talking about this right before the show started, right? We haven't even gotten confirmation whether or not the state back rescue is actually happening. Going to be, go, go, happening yeah. Right? But markets have obviously rallied on the news. We're up uh, really, really good three days or so. Futures still are pointing lower, as with uh, most markets that are up and running uh, right now. We have two markets in the Asia Pacific, by the way, uh, not online today, Australia, and of course, later on, you don't have India um, as well. Uh, we're calling it sideways because you have some stock futures also, as you can see in Europe, still pushing higher as well. Now, that being said, global stocks have been in a six or seven day run. So but this was bound to happen at some point. What's interesting over the last and flip the boards, please, over the last, what, 24, 48 hours is, you know, Yvonne was talking about Shein, for example, 30 percent. That's the discount that some you know, of these asset managers are trying to uh, discount some of their hard assets in China, for example. It's almost a repricing of current valuations. Intel, we just showed you that. Uh, Tesla was down about 10, 11 percent. I digress. Uh, back to markets right now. Commodity markets, we're pulling back on Brent. We're playing some catch up on Shanghai crude. We'll watch out for some of these energy plays. We're up as a sector as we speak, but not a lot. Bond markets, ECB overnight, PCE uh, is coming out of the U.S. Uh, later uh, today. And of course, we were just coming off really almost a confirmation of uh, the U.S. economy, no landing in 2020, 2023. Uh, the currency markets, uh, dollar yen, you have dollar China. And I guess when you look at this, we're looking ahead to the renminbi fix of the day, which has averaged, the spread has averaged about 600 pips so far this year. So there has been some anchoring out of the PBOC, which might also act as another sort of backstop uh, for this rally if we do get that today. Yep. So, I mean, if you take a look at the superlatives of this week, it's been quite interesting, right? It's something that is, you know, I guess quite refreshing for all of us to watch here. Just the amount of momentum behind the, the last three days has been quite remarkable, right? You take a look at what the, 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 the you know, CSI 300 was doing. Uh, you know, MSCI China was, is, were set for the best week in six months. Hang Seng China, or index, I should say, that's seeing the best week in a year. You have eight shares also seeing the best week in 14 months. So however you slice it, you know, there is at least some momentum behind this here right now. The key thing I'm, I'm guessing is the follow through, right? If we see implementation, it's now time for more decisive sort of action from policymakers in order for this to really continue. But yeah, it certainly has been eventful, a whirlwind this week, Dave. Certainly, I'm looking forward to talking to our, our guest later on out of BNP, of course, head of Asia Derivatives, right? Because to what extent has the rally, at least in Hong Kong, been short covering? Yeah. You know, now we've now sort of squared that circle. Uh, where does it leave us for next week? It's not just in China, right? So you're seeing some of the China proxies out there. Fantastic week for mining stocks. Uh, iron ore, as you can see, is up, what, 4.4% this week. And this, this is certainly one other part to the Chinese market we're tracking, commodity markets, which have also rallied of late. Uh, let's bring in Lianting to our Asia Stocks Managing Editor in Singapore for us. Her team has been extremely busy covering all the angles to the story. Lianting. Let's start off with the, this Morgan Stanley note, which dropped about two hours back, give or take. They're pairing their expectations, though, uh, on these Chinese markets. Yeah, I mean, they first came out in August to say they're they're cutting China weighting uh, to equal weighting uh, from a more a bullish, more of a bullish stance. And today they came out to say that given the past few months, money flow and sentiment shift in Asia and EM space, in which we saw a lot of money actually came out of China to go into uh, India and Japan. And that is sort of confirming their view that this trend will continue. And 
that's why they're turning a little bit more bearish on Chinese stocks by cutting uh, the index targets by uh, the end of 2024. In the meantime, they are actually raising the target for Japanese stocks, thinking that the, the yawning gap between China and Japanese shares or share performance will continue from here. Yeah, we're flashing those forecasts here right now, those targets, I should say. But Nanting, I mean, what, what would you need to see for a day four of this rally today? I mean, I'm just wondering what's <laughs> yeah. your team looking at here today uh, on what could keep it going for now? Yeah, I think uh, right now all eyes are on uh, the official confirmation on our scoop, which is about uh, 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 roughly 300 billion sort of dollar or rescue fund uh, to prop up the uh, Chinese stock market. I think uh, the the latest is that things are getting really close to the finishing line. So if that can be officially confirmed, and that would definitely sort of propel the rally a little bit further. Um, and we're also watching out for all those forecasts for. Or, uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the <clears throat> excuse me, the upcoming Chinese Lunar New Year spending. Uh, I think the expectation right now is for uh, the spending to be actually a bit more lukewarm compared to uh, last year. And one more thing I think uh, people are watching out for is Chinese earnings season. I think we just uh, uh, kick-started uh, about two, three days ago with uh, some education companies listed in the U.S. They actually reported good earnings, uh, but those are sort of very small companies by now. Uh, the heavyweights will still come a few a few months later, so we'll get more clarity later on. Lian Ting Tu, thank you so much. Laying out the day for us. We're just getting started. 20 minutes to the open, so we're going to get busy uh, as we head into this open uh, later today. Now, we, we, we've talked about the markets part of the conversation. Let's wrap up. The, the rethinking in yeah. economics and trajectory? And, and I think you've seen the likes of Goldman saying, look, this doesn't mean, you know, Pan Gongshan is not done. I think that was a lot mm. of what, you know, people thought, got out of that press briefing and yeah. how dovish he actually did sound, especially mm. when he talked about deflation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, is coming out with some forecasts now. We had Chang Shu on yesterday saying, look, this maybe does push forward their expectations of what comes out when it comes to monetary policy. They're forecasting now 100 basis points of cuts that we could be seeing, whether it's policy rates and the like, uh, in the next few months or so. So certainly that mm. is what people are thinking. I think the fiscal side might take some time, but at least monetary policy, that looks a little bit more decisive now. Absolutely. And when you get those two things in coordination, right, fiscal and, and monetary first, and then fiscal, you know, we'll, you know, we're moving into NPC. Yeah. That's seven weeks away. So arguably the next eight week window are going to be crucial for this Chinese market. And, you know, we'll take a break, obviously, in between because of Lunar New Year. So we, we do have some momentum going into that. But anyway, we're just painting it out what the possibilities lie ahead here. Now, speaking of, uh, we're looking ahead to the open right now, just uh, over 20 minutes away here. BNP, we talked about this. The, uh, we're talking der derivatives, call options, and what they're seeing underneath the hood and how they're trading this market this week. Jason Louie joins us at about the open today. Also coming up, we'll hear from the founder and CIO, Quadrata Capital, to talk us through, well, it's a path for the Fed. Meetings next week. I believe we are in the blackout period as we go into that crucial meeting. Yep. Also, when it comes to what happens in this market open, we're counting down to Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Futures are suggesting maybe we could see some downside here today. We're lower by four-tenths of one percent. This is Boomer Markets trying to open. Happy Friday. All right, you take a look at when it comes to U.S. Treasuries. Yeah, we're, we're pretty much stabilizing here in, in the Asia session. You see, still see the 10-year just below that 4% level. And really, that was despite this GDP number. I think it's that a really, five-year, though. Is it a five -year? Sorry, my bad, five-year. Yeah. My eyes are really, really bad right now. Uh, <laughs> GDP numbers uh, grew 3.3% last quarter. That really was a blowout number. And yeah. I think the market just kind of brushed it off in some ways. Yeah, backward looking. Yeah. But it does tell us, of course, there is some momentum here going into this year. But I think if you look at the recent data, maybe you could make a stronger argument that there is some landing taking place. Certainly no landing took place there uh, in, <laughs> in, in 2023. Nancy Davis is with us, founder, CIO, Quadratic Capital Management, joining us today. Good morning from the Asia Pacific. So no landing last year, question mark, landing this year. I look at the four, well, this 4.1% handle on the tenure. It doesn't, I mean, do you think it's a possibility, Nancy, that we could also get no landing this year in the U.S. economy? 
Well, things seem pretty uh, pretty priced for perfection this year. Um, unlike coming into, if you remember the start of 23, everybody was so buried up. You know, it was a real, the sentiment was terrible. Now it's kind of opposite day where everybody's, you know, everybody's bullish. Everything is wonderful. The data's great. You know, it seems like the risks are skewed to the downside because the expectations that everything is going to be fine and the Fed's going to cut a lot are priced in. Yeah, and, and what does this mean for the positioning in this market, right? I think the long treasuries trade was certainly something that was very popular uh, leading up to the end of last year. You know, what happens to those longs now that we're starting to see some cracks form? Well, I think people need to remember that, you know, owning more duration is more risk. And right now we still have an inverted yield curve in the U.S., unlike many other markets around the world that have a positively shaloped uh, yield curve, given the, the 10 years 411 right now on your Bloomberg terminal, and the policy rate is five and a quarter, that's not a very, you know, necessarily safe place to be unless you think the Fed's going to cut a lot. Um, and I think that's why people have been rushing into long duration, because they're sort of with their hands out expecting the Fed to cut dramatically. And what if what if we're higher for longer? And what if the Fed doesn't cut as much as the market's pricing in? So, I mean, the debate is about March, whether that's too soon or, or uh, f fits right. Is, is the inflation debate conclusive enough? Is the economy slowing down enough mm. to justify that? Well, it's interesting because the data that's coming out on the inflation side definitely looks like things are cooling. A lot of people are talking about uh, the U.S importing deflation from China, that things are fine here and the Fed can really cut rates. I think the big the big risk is what if the Fed does cut rates and what if inflation is not over? What if it's still a risk? Because if you look at um, the break even curves in the U.S. looking at the inflation protected bond market, they're all right hugging around 2%. You know, you can see the the five year, the ten year, the thirty year, they're all around two point two seven, two point three. So the market is really expecting uh, CPI inflation to be around two percent. And I think the question is, what if the Fed does cut, and what if inflation is not a story that they won? Um, we also have the, um, the swap lines coming to an end in March. So if you remember, it, it seems like so long ago, but. It was less than a year ago that the U.S. had the Silicon Valley banking crisis, and that's when the Fed came out with this BTSP, the swap lines, to give liquidity to banks. That's going to be pared back in March, um, kind of phasing it out because a lot of banks are arbing the market right now. And we're also going to see what does that do to liquidity? Does that make repo rates go higher you know, how does that all play in? Because uh, as you can see on your Bloomberg terminal, the market is still pricing in some probability that we are going to get a cut from the Fed in March. Yeah, 50-50, uh, in fact, almost, uh, looking, at, yeah. uh, looking at swaps here. Uh, and you got to yeah, imagine 13 with... 13 basis points. <laughs> so. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, well, so <laughs> slight, slightly below 50. Um, <laughs> is there anything... Well, well you got to imagine with March being so near. Fine, we have another meeting that's next week. They're in a blackout period right now, so there's no guidance, obviously, at this point in time. But, you know, looking at the rhetoric going into the blackout period, it, it seems unimaginable that they can just flip the narrative and come out with a statement that's, that's dovish. Do you think that's a possibility still, though? I don't think so, personally. Um, but, you know, I think the Fed has definitely told us they'll talk out of one side of the mouth and do something totally opposite. You know, the thing that comes to mind is... Uh, you know, the old, um, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates and transient and all that stuff. So I just think we have to kind of, nobody can really predict policymakers and what they say is not always what they do. Uh, talk to us about the, the strong dollar. And, you know, you were flagging this to us uh, during the ad break. The strong dollar is making U.S. firms do something. And w why is that relevant to this conversation, Nancy? And what are they doing? Well, the rhetoric in the U.S. is that we're going to have a manufacturing renaissance and that jobs are coming back to the U.S. and things are going to be made here again, things that might have been made overseas um, over the last, say, you know, 10, 20, 30 decade, uh, past decades. But the big question in my mind is the dollar. 
Because if you're just a company and you're rational about the cost of labor, it's a lot cheaper given the strong dollar to have labor be overseas. And so I think that's kind of my questioning of, of the perception because everybody in the United States or the talk that everybody's going is like, we're going to have this manufacturing renaissance. That would be obviously wonderful if it does happen, but is it something that's not priced in? Is that a risk that kind of everybody is thinking this way when you hear the sell side research, the equity strategists, kind of everybody coming out and talking about how great things are in the US? Well, what about the dollar? Because that does make labor as well as other types of services much cheaper overseas. Uh, last question, I mean, how do you form some sort of fixed income strategy now? I mean, given that you said a lot of it's been priced for perfection, what still looks attractive to you, Nancy? So I personally, I think if you're going to own regular treasury bonds, I think T-bills are the way to go. That's a short dated treasury. Um, you get a much higher yield Obviously, you have reinvestment risk, so the Fed cuts a lot more than it's expected. You might have you know, a lower yield bond in the future, but I think given the unknowns, I think T-bills are a pretty good place to be hiding out. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I do think inflation protected bonds are also good value. I think the one problem with inflation protected bonds on their own is it's only the consumer price index. That's just one index and it might not be the only way to measure inflation, especially, you know, today's GDP report was, I think people just threw it away. They're like, whatever, we're not even buying it. Um, <laughs> because so many of the revisions from the BLS change, you know, the numbers come out great, and then they get revised down. So I think there's a lot of the emphasis on the B and the S in the BLS. Sorry, bad joke. <laughs> but um, yeah. we, uh, no, we'll that was a good one. <laughs> Probably not appropriate for Bloomberg Television. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Got to yeah. keep things light. Well, we, um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's definitely a question of like what the data, can you rely on it? And I think inflation protected bonds do offer value, but I think tips alone have the problem of just being CPI inflation. Uh, we, we didn't get to talk about the Fed's BS balance sheet, right? <laughs> Nancy, right. this one for you. There Happy Friday. There was the BS. <laughs> <laughs> Quantitative tightening, to be more specific. Or QT. All right, Nancy, thank you so much. Founder, CIO, thank Quadratic you. Capital Management. Happy, happy Thursday evening. Happy Friday, of course, to our viewers out there. Okay, uh, what do we have? RMB fix for today's out. Bottom of your screens, it's still quite a spread over 600 pips. It's on the stronger side, futures are pointing down. 10 minutes at opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Okay, welcome back. So, yeah, futures were on point. Some weakness coming through after three days of fairly big gains on, on price. Volumes are coming back as well, so maybe a time to, to, to take stock. Take stock and maybe look into some other things that could be in the pipeline here, especially yeah. when it comes to IPOs. Uh, we've learned that investors in Shein are trying to sell shares in the private market deals that value the online retailer as low as $45 billion. And the firm achieved a valuation of roughly $66 billion during last year's fundraising. So that's where that discount mm -hmm. comes out. Let's bring in our deals reporter, Manuel Belgori, joining us. I mean, the perceptions of this company certainly have been dwindling now. And definitely, it's been happening for quite some time. I mean, we saw the latest round uh, in May at $66 billion. And, and then in the private market, it seems to be getting even, even worse. And that's down from a kind of like prospect valuation of $90 billion uh, in a potential IPO in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I think, I think valuation is really, really the main hurdle for, for this company. They have very high value expectations and investors came in at, at a very top evaluation in the past and I think it's going to be really hard for them to, to pull that off. Yeah, it seems because 
so 66 was May, but we're, we're, you know, 66 is coming off 100 billion. Exactly. Right? If you, so I guess they're trying to cash out before these things uh, corrects even further. But the question is, how liquid is this, is this private market anyway, right? This isn't the things that trade every day, for example. Yeah, right? it is actually, that's a good point, David. It's, it's not very liquid at this point in time because, I mean, the bid ask is just too wide. I think some of the investors came in uh, really high and then now they're trying to exit and, and monetize that. Mm. The, the, those shares and then they're, they're not just finding buyers that are willing to buy at that level I mean I think I think she is being caught uh, in, in a perfect storm with uh, intensifying competition uh, from the likes of uh, of Temo from uh, yeah. Pinduoduo and, and, and other international players on top of that you have the regulatory crackdown uh, which yeah. is kind of happening as we speak uh, with Chinese regulators trying to weigh in and whether or not they are ready to go ahead with the IPO in the US, uh, the SEC is also kind of waiting for them to kind of like uh, see whether they can go ahead or not. Investors in the meantime trying to, to look for a liquidity event in, yeah. in, any, in any way. So um, yeah, let's see how it plays out. I think the next few months are going to be quite important and we'll see how the market also, whether they, it is stabilizes yeah. or not because for these sizable IPOs is key. Yeah, okay. Quite a few hurdles ahead. <laughs> More than a <laughs> to few. To say the least. But after three days of gains, it's slightly yeah. It's slightly better. Yeah. Manuel, thank you so much. <laughs> um, happy, happy Friday. Okay, a um, couple of things as far as the your Friday agenda is concerned here. So uh, w we did see, of course, early weakness already coming and permeating across these markets, eight-tenths of one percent towards the, the more growth side of the conversation here. Uh, we're also looking at commodity prices. Metals prices have been bid up uh, this week. Yeah, I think industrial metals are, are yeah, saying copper, the, aluminum. Yeah, best best week we've seen in, in a while. Yep. Um, and you're certainly seeing that in copper go. prices are still edging slightly higher here, but the rest are seeing a little more of a tempered sort of sentiment here today. But in terms of the agenda, we're watching very closely if we get to get another day of this rally. So far, the pre-market and the like, we're not seeing that right now, but certainly surging turnover, those volumes, whether that can actually last. We're watching some of these properties assets, luxury good stocks, given a, a bit of resilience that we saw in those LVMH earnings as well. We'll see if that helps to like some of these luxury goods that are listed here in Hong mm -hmm. Kong. And, of course, more signs of stimulus possible. Yeah, which we could actually get later. I'm not saying that's, that, that's, you know, that, that, that's a home run, but yeah. you know, certainly investors are looking at these afternoon briefings. Now, and we have one today out of the Ministry of Commerce following the, uh, the pleasant surprise we got out of the PBOC and Pan Gongsheng uh, over on the week. Uh, LVMH, more on that, in fact, so one of the lines coming through on China here is that the company says that the Chinese market is still absorbing high cognac inventory. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go, and hence we're looking at Prada, for example. Prada's up 1%. Mm. Uh, we're going to watch like some Chow Tai Fook, the like, and, and then we're looking at, of course, some of these gaming stocks. Uh, there was another, uh, a few games, or at least a batch of them, that were approved by regulators, oh. or Tencent being one of them, but that stopped mm. down about 9 tenths of 1%, pairing back some of the big gains that we saw overnight or yesterday. The Open is next. This is Bloomberg. Ah, get us to the weekend. Get us there. What a week it's been. Weakness coming through on price on an index level, as you can see. A50 futures down about two tenths of one percent. Hang Seng's down about three tenths of one percent. We're coming off what? What? I think at these levels, we're still on on track for you know, the best weeks in months. I think some of these benchmarks, if on, even go back to, I think it was more than the, a year. The, the Paul Pierre meeting in July comes to mind too, because he had a, a good week there. And in the week that was really good before that was this reopening rally. And yeah. we all know what happened. I mean, there. even up, what, 8% in, in the Hang Seng yeah. this week? It's nuts. Um, so, you know, I think it makes sense that maybe we're seeing a little bit of a, a pairing back here today. Mm. And really, as we call it, a reality check across these markets after the volatility that we've seen, that surge in turnover and the like here. So we are at least ending uh, this Friday. Still a positive note to end the week, but then again, a little bit of tempered optimism. You take a look at how the Open is faring out here in Shanghai high as well as Hong Kong. Uh, we are still seeing a more downside potentially here uh, in the onshore market. CSI 300, uh, we're down about half of 1%. But mind you, we saw plenty of momentum in the onshore markets more so than Hang Seng yesterday in some ways. HS Tech, though, we're down by 1%. And we're watching very closely what happens when it comes to some of these metal prices as well, which we're starting to see iron ore pair back a little bit. Uh, Shanghai crude, though, take a look at that. We're up some 3%. We're at 
I think the best week since October for oil prices uh, amidst all these geopolitical concerns. Obviously, this prospect of more China stimulus is really kind of bringing up the price of crude as well. So we're watching very closely what this means for oil producers. Uh, you're watching sector by sector. It's still mostly in the red at the get-go here. Developers are catching that slight bit here today. If you take a look at the CSI 300 and what we're seeing uh, with our index from BI. So. You know, we're looking for more signs of that follow through, right? Implementation is now key. Now that, you know, the, it seems like this synchronized, coordinated sort of response has been laid out. As we talk to our colleague Lanting, too, we're still waiting for that confirmation of that stock market yeah. stabilization fund. If we actually get it today, mm. uh, does that mean, you know, buy on rumor, sell on news, or can we actually see more confirmation of this that can give some more momentum behind this rally? We're watching very closely gaming stocks. Uh, we saw China approving more domestic games, despite what we saw with those harsh gaming curbs in December. Does that reassure the market in some ways? You're looking at Tencent, which was actually getting a green line on one of their games. It's still lower by nine tenths of one percent. Uh, Prada, of course, we talked about the LVMH story. That's helping that stock just slightly here today. We're watching Child High Folk as well. But yes, sales proven resilient uh, when it comes to LVMH here amid this broader luxury slowdown. The China factor certainly does play a part of that as well. And we're watching oil producers, the miners, the like here. So yes, it is a little bit of pairing back. So ENN Energy, that was up double digits yesterday. Uh, we're pairing back now by about 5%. Uh, but PetroChina still catching a slight bit. Jijing Mining, Jiangxi Copper all down this morning. Yeah, PetroChina was quite, was big. Uh, oh yeah. Up quite a bit yesterday, right? Yes, you rarely see moves like that yeah. in that stock. Yeah. Anyway, well, we rarely seen a week like this uh, over the last few months or so. All right, Morgan Stanley, just a reminder of yours, came out with this note just dropped in our inbox. It's about, about two hours back. There are new targets on Chinese benchmarks, and they, they've needed to really pair that back and really upgrade Japan, which they previously thought was 2,600 on the topics. They now see it at 2,800. And so Hang Seng, this is end 2024, 16,000. MSCI China, in case you're curious where we are, we're at 53, okay, let's call it 53. They now see that basically remaining flat uh, for the year. Uh, what's also picked up, so this is the next 12 months, what picked up yesterday, perhaps worth noting moving forward, trading activity, right? So volumes on the Hang Seng topping 4 billion, 42 on the Shanghai comp, number of shares, number of shares. And turnover, though, nearly 900 billion yuan. That's overall on the onshore market. So things have certainly woken up this week. Joining us here on set to talk us through what really took place underneath <laughs> the hood. Jason Louie, head of APAC Equity Derivative Strategy at BNP. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Tell us a story. What happened this week? What did you see? Sure. I think you mentioned about derivative. Uh, what is interesting to us is that when you look at what's happening on the cash market, being the index level, versus what's happening in the derivative market, you actually get a slightly different picture. Mm. So if you look at the past three, four weeks, we have seen the overall index continue to drift lower and lower, partly because the market were a little bit worried about the policy implementation and also the policy coordination. Now, for the past few days, we have seen a little bit of that changing, which is positive development. You would have thought that as the index continued to drift lower and lower, there needs to be more fear in the market. I think in the U.S., people look at the VIX as a fear gauge, so market goes down, fear goes up. What we have noticed in the Hong Kong space is that, yes, when the market goes down, volatility goes up to reflect the fact that the market is more volatile. But the cost of protection, in this case, people willing to pay for these so-called out-of-the-money put, it hasn't increased to the same magnitude that you would expect it. So, for example, if you thought that the market is down 15, 20 percent, mm. you would think that people want to pay more to protect that downside. Mm. What we have observed is that that drawdown perhaps is due to people simply liquidating their position. So if you do not have a position, then you may not need to protect them. And so we ended up seeing a scenario, the so-called relative cost of puts and costs, uh, calls actually drifted lower and lower. Okay. On the flip side, you have people saying, hey, Hong Kong China is down 15, 20 percent. Yeah. Perhaps there is a short squeeze, which we did see a couple of days ago. And we continue to see people just willing to spend a little bit of premium on the upside just in case. Because one of the lessons we learned from last year is that even though the market overall was down, we have episodes of these very concentrated 5 to 10 percent rally. Yeah. And so for the fast money, they don't want to miss that. So they're willing to spend a little bit of premium just to protect themselves on the other end of the distribution, mm -hmm. which resulted in a rather unique situation where you have the index going down, but the derivative market is not necessarily showing you the same level of concern, simply looking at the relative cost of protection versus upside. So what does that tell you about whether this rally can, can, can last? Sure. Does it, does it, is it sustainable in that way? If, if there's not as much fear mm -hmm. 
that you're seeing uh, in the derivatives market. Sure. Allow me to maybe take a step back to maybe dissect why we're in this situation to begin with. If we rewind the clock about two months ago, heading into the Central Economic Work Conference in December, there were expectations that perhaps the government will give us some hint whether or not they will introduce more stimulus for the year 2024. The outcome of that meeting was rather neutral at best. And then heading into the beginning of the year, people were wondering, hey, maybe start of the new year, more policy. And there were some rising expectation of a MOF rate cut, which we did not get. Yeah. So it created this negative feedback loop that you had expectation of policy. It didn't deliver. And then you get into that, hey, maybe the government is actually do not want to spend too much money this year. And it kind of spiraled downwards. Yeah. And for the past two days, it seems to us that the policymakers acknowledged that there could be some uh, confusions in the market regarding their commitment to stabilize growth. Mm. And so our view is that, and similar to what you reported earlier, one of uh, our peers have changed their target. Our view has been that we are neutral on the Hong Kong-China market mm. because we think at the end of the day, it all depends on the implementation of the policy. What you're seeing right now is this normalization of this extremely bearish sentiment that accumulated over the past few weeks. Mm. So if you look at some of those index movement, yeah. we are probably just returning back to where we started. And then the next leg will have to be whether or not they introduce a credible set of policy at the National People's Congress, which mm -hmm. we believe will start in early March. Right. So whether it's news flow announcements, indexes, second order market metrics, name, name one thing you're watching closely that if that changes, the complexion of this market's now changed from this bearish downtrend we're still in right now. Sure. What could it be? Sure. I think in this case, what we need to look at is the consistency of that policy. Because okay. right now, we have seen specific sectors that are coming up with policy. You mentioned about gaming, right? Mm. So for the past two months, it has been a roller coaster ride when it comes to mobile gaming company. Mm. You had a negative shock in December, and then there seems to be some course correction over the past few weeks. Mm. But only one sector is not enough. We have seen for the past few days there are more narrative on helping the property developer getting financing as well. But what we need is a coordinated with a top-down message and say these are the few things that we need to tackle. Mm -hmm. So for example, this year, one of the new initiatives is so-called three major projects where they need to solve public housing, they need to develop some of the uh, inner city redevelopment and the dual-use infrastructure. If we get more clarity on how much money the government is willing to spend on these projects, yeah. we can get a better sense of can these projects become a new growth driver because we do need some new growth driver for the year 2024. Right. I was going to ask you about um, why the sell-off really exposed some, you know, these, these snowball derivatives, mm -hmm. that, which I, we really haven't talked about until you know, this week, basically, of, of these, you, know, you're, you buy into this, you get a coupon if it mm -hmm. stays in some sort yeah. of range or not. I mean, yeah. that basically led to all these knock-on effects. How popular are these products really in the market right sure. now? Sure. I mean, because they really exacerbate the sell-off in many yes. ways. So I think, first of all, the, these kind of snowball products are typically, uh, we categorize as auto-callable structure that is actually fairly popular across Asia in markets like Japan and Korea, and also in European markets where interest rate tends to be quite low. So the retail investor is trying to gain higher coupon mm. by purchasing these structured products. So snowboard itself is not necessarily something that is completely new when it comes to derivative market. Mm. I think what is slightly difference is that it's becoming a lot more, I would say, mainstream in terms of news reporting. I think you mentioned your colleagues have been very on top of these kind of situation. And so it created a feedback loop where people are looking at these key levels on this structure and they look at the market and say, hey, the market is trending down. Will or will not these uh, derivative players trying to hatch themselves. Mm -hmm. So you created this negative feedback loop. Why is the market down? Because you have this trigger level. Yeah. And why do you have this trigger level? Because the market is down. So what we've seen over the past few days is that with these kind of coordinated message, at least you stop that negative feedback loop. And yeah. we have seen yesterday, the small mid cap indices actually rebound a little bit. And so I would say that snowball is part of the reason why people amplified or exacerbated the negative view, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the only trigger sure. because I think the, the main driver for the decline this year is still that lack of policy continue, uh, coordination yeah. and the lack of visibility on the new growth drivers. Bob, let's help make some of our viewers some money here. <laughs> um, 
And here's your plug. You have a you have a BNP charging infrastructure basket. That's talk right. to us about that, and also talk to us about this upstream midstream index too. Sure, no problem. I think earlier you mentioned some of the rise in the commodities prices, mm. and so what we've observed is that over the past years, while people are downbeat on China's economic growth, some of the upstream industry like energy, material, engineering actually has done quite well. The main reason is because these part of the segments are still quite sensitive to commodity price, and commodity price has been quite resilient relative to the growth expectation of China last year. And we think if PPI continue to improve this year, then these upstream industry should continue to do well, and they have outperformed quite a bit. And I think that may attract more flow into that. Very quickly, five seconds or so. Does this market need some version of QE from China? Um, I think it is. Depends on the definition of QE. Okay. If you look well, a massive at massive amount of money, um, I don't think at this point the Chinese policymaker are ready for that. Because if you look at some of the uh, the statements that they have made in the mm. past few years, I think they are quite cognizant of the fact that when the Western economy deployed the QE style, you ended up creating some uh, unintended consequences. I think they are okay. very well aware of that. So at this moment, based on their statement, we don't think it's a high likelihood. <laughs> Jason, great to have you. Jason Lawyer there, head of APEC Fantastic. Equity and Derivative Strategy at BNP Paribas. We have plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Okay, uh, the milestone overnight is Microsoft was flirting with this level. It closed above the three trillion dollar market cap level, so it, it's now joined Apple, of course, in that. So just two right now, according to my account, that's Apple and Microsoft. Aramco is get this about a trillion below. It's a very weird sentence, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of and the useful on Microsoft too. You know, they announced these job cuts, of course, as it pertains to that acquisition they had with Activision Blizzard, and now a few months after that, they've now managed to come out with perhaps yeah. some, uh, what, a lining of resources, if you will, and what that actually All looks right. like. There we go. The lone two mm. in that club. Um, we're watching Intel, of course, and the, the, the fallout, I guess, from the stock overall uh, on chip makers here this morning. I mean, it, it fell some 10 percent or some extended trade. Yeah. Um, the bleak forecast, so maybe this comeback is coming back a little bit to more slowly than first thought. It was 11 percent sales missed in the first quarter as well. They're not really playing in this whole AI story in some ways. They're actually kind of a bit behind. So maybe mm. that means uh, chip makers here. Uh, certainly could be uh, seeing some pressure here today, but just goes to show the headwinds that we're seeing still when it comes to PCs, when it comes to servers, the like here as well. Uh, but then we're going to have more of those questions to the Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger, mm. uh, joining us in US TV a little bit later on for more on his companies and the industry outlook that is coming up on Bloomberg Technology. Yep, certainly that interview is one to watch and the stock, of course, as we approach the open in the US. If the Tesla analogy is any indication, um, yesterday was down about 10%. That's not going to be a good thing later today. Anyway, staying in tech, three of the biggest firms in the industry, Alphabet, Amazon, and Microsoft, have received inquiries from a U.S. regulator about their investments and partnerships in AI. Sue Keenan is with us in New York for the story. With the story, Sue, what's, so we're talking about the FTC here, aren't we? And what, what's, what's, what's bothering them? Yeah, the Federal Trade Commission, it appears they're concerned that a small number, three major tech companies, are funneling billions of dollars into uh, open AI startups, and they want to make sure uh, that they're closely monitoring this. Uh, the trade FTC made clear in a uh, public workshop, in fact, we heard from FTC Chair Lena Khan, that these AI companies, in her view, quote, cannot use claims of innovation as cover for law breaking. So they're concerned about the competitive landscape. The FCC said it sent subpoenas to five companies to gather information, and the probe focuses on more than 19 billion investments by Microsoft, Amazon, and Alphabet's Google, a series of transactions that cemented alliances between the world's cloud server giants and the leading developers of AI software. So usually the Justice Department conducts these antitrust investigations. What's changed here? 
Well, what's changed is probably a combination of both politics and the fact that the FTC has the authority uh, to uh, really get involved here. We do know that one member of the FTC has criticized the tech giants for structuring their transactions in a way designed to avoid the U.S. merger law. And the merger law requires companies to notify antitrust enforcers when they're creating partnerships. So the agency is using its authority to issue subpoenas to gather information in what's considered to be a market study, but it then has the authority to launch probes or aid in existing probes. Uh, Microsoft, for instance, invested more than $13 billion in chat GPT maker OpenAI. Uh, Google, back in October, committed to back Anthropic. That is another startup started in 2021 from a lot of employees from OpenAI. Uh, they committed about $2 billion. Amazon last year also agreed to an investment of as much as $4 billion. So again, there's a concern that perhaps uh, the relationships between these companies is not clear. They want information to make it clear. Back to you. All right, Sue, thank you, Sue Keenan, there on the latest. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to, of course, these big tech companies and uh, what the FTC is looking at, let's focus on AI here and really uh, in Taiwan, uh, too. The island is building its own AI language model to counter China's influence and establish a foothold in the budding AI ecosystem. Joining us now from Taipei is our bureau chief there, Samsung Ellis. Samsung, tell us about this model. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want an indication of why this is so important for Taiwan to have its own solution to this, if you know the options for you, if you're using Chinese uh, for the like for large language models, so there's ChatGPT. It does have a Chinese language option. It's not particularly good. Uh, the most used one in the, in Chinese is Baidu's Ernie bot. Um, but if you type in, for example, uh, into Ernie, um, or you ask Ernie who won the recent uh, election in Taiwan, it will give you the correct answer. It will say Lai Qingde. But then it also adds on top of that, no matter what, how the situation in Taiwan changes, there will always be one China. So this really crystallizes the concerns for Taiwan around relying too heavily on uh, these kinds of uh, solutions and these kind of software developed in in China, and so that's why the government has set aside uh, around 550 million U.S. dollars to develop its own uh, AI tools, and part of that will go towards a large language model like ChatGPT, uh, but a Taiwanese one, so that they can have confidence that Taiwanese uh, businesses, you know, banks, hospitals, government agencies uh, can use uh, you know, a ChatGPT-like uh, functionality without uh, r concerns over political influence. And of course, if you're sitting in, in Taiwan, it's a huge concern. Uh, you, know, you see the likes of uh, the Chinese uh, software giants like TikTok and Xiaohongshu having an increasing influence uh, in Taiwan. So Taiwan does want to develop its own uh, solutions for these kinds of uh, things. Uh, so the developers say it's likely to come online or be ready for testing at least by April. And they're fully aware that the amount of money they're dedicating the, to this isn't enough to make it a rival to Baidu or to chat GPT. Uh, but they say for Taiwan's needs, decent is good enough. Hmm. Well, okay. Well, that's that's great. Okay, Sam, thank you so much. Sam Ellis there in, in Taipei for us about 20 minutes into the Friday session, and we're slightly weak on the knees here, uh, particularly when you look at these uh, growth in tech names, HS Tech leading declines right now. Although on price, not a lot. I mean, four tenths of one percent, that barely takes us back to one point in the afternoon yesterday. Any more ahead. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. One of the ones we're working on at the moment is how do we charge back into Ukraine as soon as uh, the European authorities say it's safe to fly in Ukraine again? Now, nobody knows when that is going to be, but we were...
Ukraine's second largest airline when the Russians invaded on the 24th of February last year. We would be Ukraine's biggest airline the week after they tell us it's safe to go back in there because we're going to charge back in there. Initially, we have a plan to open up about 30 routes from four Ukrainian airports back into the European Union. And then we want to, I think, in the first, within six to 12 months, open up three or four large bases in Ukraine. And we're talking to the Ukrainian authorities about creating an environment, cost agreement, on which we could lead the charge of air travel uh, into a post-war Ukrainian recovery. All right, Yvonne, what are you doing on this date? It's my sister's birthday. Is it? Yeah, so we'll probably be celebrating on that day. Not this day. year, though. So, so <laughs> well, it, it will still be her birthday. Uh, if analysts are correct, mm. and the methodology here is, we've taken a look at the implied upside on HSCI stocks. We've been put that on an index level, 47% over 12 months. And if we do 47%, 47%, and an increment, that gets us back to that high that we hit back uh, in, in 2015. Um, so that's 913 days away, assuming wow. analysts are correct. So, I mean, it's rough math and obviously don't... So basically you have insults. to wait more than two and a half years. Yeah. Okay. But it took me longer to so get over heartbreak anyway, so <laughs> put that into context. Oh, you're romantic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's just giving you some size and scope on really how, how pessimistic this market is right now. But certainly we've seen the wheels turning a little bit the last few days. Mm -hmm. uh, can that continue? That's still the key question here today. Take a look at some of these movers that we're seeing. Uh, gaming stocks, certainly one thing. So China proving more domestic games. Um, that's not really doing too much when it comes to some of these stocks here. But look at Tencent. We're down some 1%. But that's really more about uh, pairing back story from yesterday. I think next ease was that the one that we talked about that we're back to levels before, before December 22 those harsh gaming curves came about yeah um, so that just goes to show there That's is a bit of a turnaround story for that stock. And we're watching some of these oil plays as well, just given where we are uh, with oil prices, uh, the best week since October. So CNOC is up some 2%. Okay, uh, so, uh, other things to look ahead to today. So U.S. PCA data is coming out. As far as China is concerned, we're obviously on the lookout for any sort of announcement and you know, that could you know, possibly does not have a specific fixed time attached to it. Although that being said, the possible sort of landmark to watch today is this Ministry of Commerce briefing mm. that's coming out in the afternoon. So watch out for that. That takes place after the close on shore. It typically still goes on uh, with about an hour left uh, of trade here in Hong Kong. And of course, we're also watching things like volumes, which exploded yesterday. We got a 42 billion share day on the Shanghai Composite. We get that today. Uh, do we get a one trillion turnover day? Asia Pacific, four tenths of one percent. U.S. futures are pulling back, and perhaps a lot of what you're seeing in the futures market is reflecting the pullback in Intel, ten eleven percent in the, yeah. in the uh, after hours trade. Jakarta comes online next. This is Bloomberg.